So our uh, final talk and final student talk of the morning is um, by Jennifer Globius. And um, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to attend this meeting. Um, my early background is in archaeology, just a heads up. And I've been working in geomorphology now, and I'm very new to modeling. So I really appreciate the um, being able to attend this meeting and learn from all of you. So my presentation today is about coupled human and natural systems, testing the impact of agricultural terraces on landscape evolution. So as the basic outline, uh, I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time looking at the research motivation. Why am I looking at agricultural terraces? Um, then I'll go through the, my plan for modeling landscape evolution of terrace terrain, and then finally look at a couple of, t of pilot studies that I've done uh, as I try to develop a model of agricultural terracing. So why should we care about agricultural terraces? I, I think in the very recent past, uh, we're now looking at how landscapes evolve with human societies. And so it's important to include the ways that humans are interacting with the landscape, impacting the landscape, and also being impacted by surface processes. I'm interested in agricultural terraces. Uh, they're found worldwide, although in many different forms. Um, here are two examples. On the left is from the Mani in Greece, mostly abandoned. And here's an example of rice terraces in China. Uh, these are surfaces that are constructed to improve agricultural production. So they share a flat tread surface where cultivation actually occurs, and they're supported by a riser, which in many cases may just be an earthen bank, or they may be stone walls, as you think of uh, regular agricultural terraces. But they're constructed to improve that agricultural production, and this is very important. And they reshape the landscape. The humans reshape the landscape um, in these areas. They're found around the world, not just China and Greece, of course. Um, and they've been constructed for thousands of years. There are examples in Greece that were constructed at least 4,000 years ago. Still constructed today, although now sometimes with bulldozers, so construction methods have changed. But very important through time. So they're made to improve agricultural production, but abandonment of this terraced land can lead to an increase in soil erosion. Um, this is a recent article in Anthropocene looking at how uh, soil degradation can actually increase in these terraced areas um, due to the lack of, of maintenance of the terrace structures themselves. Um, it, looking at a literature review of of many, many different terracing studies um, and borrowing from the idea of life cycle assessment. So looking at, which is used to assess the environmental impact of different products, such as plastic bottles from the raw products to their use and then their eventual um, uh, disposal. If we apply that to agricultural terraces, we can look at life cycle stages from construction of the terraces where the sediment is moved as that landscape is shaped, the amount depending upon the original topography and also the form of the terraces um, into use. And I'm sorry, this is kind of dark. There's a stone wall right here, the terrace riser itself, and it reduces the distance of sediment flow downhill. So reducing that sediment flux. Um, after abandonment, um, you have terraces. Sometimes they experience structural failure, such as right here, which then uh, directs the flow of water and also sediment into those areas, so increasing the chance of erosion. Um, and in some cases, you get reconstruction of those terraces, a reshaping of the land again, and then bringing that land back into use. And we have geoarchaeological studies um, especially in Greece and other places that show that 
through time, there have been multiple cycles of terracing in different places. So this cycle um, has been illustrated with archaeological evidence. So I'm looking at the Tregani's Plateau in Messenia, Greece. So this light gray is Messenia. Tregani's Plateau is about there. I'm interested in how the human decisions regarding terrace maintenance impact landscape evolution. So how have people either constructing and then maintaining, eventually abandoning those terraces in this landscape, have shaped it through time and will continue to shape this landscape? Um, and these are some examples from this area. Here you see a terrace wall that's um, in place, holding back uh, soil loss from further downhill. And these other two images, and I'm sorry it's hard to see, this is what looks like a terrace wall in a road cut. Um, and it looks like it's been covered with sediment, so abandoned for a very long time. And then this image, it's an area that looks like it could possibly have a terrace. Um, I found one stone right about there, but we don't have other indications that this was actually a terrace. It looks like it was something possibly abandoned, and then sediment has been covering it since. So have terraces previously been put into any landscape evolution models or uh, erosion models? The answer is yes. Um, in the re revised universal soil loss equation, um, of course, the support practice can be changed to reflect terraces and as well as the slope and length factors. Um, similarly, this study looked at the unit stream powered erosion deposition model, uses many of the same factors as Russell, um, slightly different, and they masked out the areas of terraces to show that there's a difference in support practice. Um, and this is from the Lapsus Landscape Evolution Model, where they included where the terraces are located and changed the infiltration rate behind them. What all of these lack, however, is the dynamics of landscape evolution through time, the human element that changes how the landscape will evolve based on the terracing. And so all of these are great if the terraces are being maintained, um, so short term, but when you're looking at areas over longer periods of time, you need to include those dynamics, or at least that's what I'm arguing. So my basic plan, I'm still in uh, the process of formulating this, and again, I'm very new to modeling, so I'm working through this. Um, so my basic idea is to couple a landscape evolution model. Um, I've been, I implemented the simple three equation landscape evolution model from Chen et al. in geomorphology, uh, basically because I wanted to learn Python um, and just learn how landscape evolution modeling really works, but hopefully any or many other landscape evolution models could work with this. And what I'm hoping to add is an agricultural terrace model um, and using agent-based modeling or individual-based modeling as it's called to show the human element because when you have terraces in an area, the decisions are not for the entire area. Instead, individual farmers or landowners are making decisions about land use, about how they're maintaining the terraces, whether they're maintaining them. Um, and then I'm hoping to add in a couple other things. Uh, you, based on empirical studies of uh, sections of riser collapses, creating a model or module for that and then including the impact of biological factors on the collapse of terraces, especially vegetation. You get trees growing in the riser walls, that's going to loosen the stones, cause collapse, and then goats, which I'll come back to in a little bit. They can knock those stones out. So I've done a couple of very basic pilot studies. Uh, this is a very simple example when I was testing the landscape evolution model. Um, looking at the difference in maintenance. So a synthetic, synthetic hillside, I included, I raised the DEM half a meter to 
represent a terrace wall and then looked at if there was a difference between maintaining these terraces, raising the height of the riser um, either every year or every four years. And this shows very little difference between them. Uh, so it might be that it needs a longer amount of time. And then I looked at the at how abandonment. So the very, so this is the original terrain with the riser. The very bottom line shows a, the terrain that has never terraced. Um, the one above that shows if the terrace was constructed but never maintained, so abandoned immediately. Um, above that, maintained for 20 years and then abandoned. This blue line shows abandonment after 50 years. And then this dark line shows abandonment after uh, never abandoning or and continuously maintaining these terraces. And so over looking at a simulation of about 100 years, there, there is a slight difference. And over longer time periods, there should be even more of a difference in the landscape. And this is a fun thing. I'm right now working on agent-based modeling. Um, and this is something that came up in my committee meeting. Um, one of my committee members talked about the influence of goats. Um, if you've been to the Mediterranean or seen anything, goats can be everywhere and they like to climb on top of things. And sometimes they have the tendency to knock stones off of the wall, which would uh, weaken the walls themselves. So I put together a very basic idea of what um, a model of goats and how they might um, tear apart some of these walls and net logo. So what you see here, this black thing, that's the goat, and it'll have a black line showing the random movement of the goat. Uh, this gray line right here, that's my basic terrace wall, and sections will turn yellow um, when the goat has actually caused damage. And this is based on a very high 20% probability so that you could see what would happen looking at it. So let's look at this. So you see random movement of the goat. It gets kind of stuck in the corner. It'll start moving again. That time it damaged it. Stuck. But very random movement. And as I said, I don't think the it'll cause quite that much damage, but just as an idea, as a first way to implement something like this, to add randomness of biological factors into this type of model is what I'm looking at. So and with that, I'm happy to take any questions or comments, and especially I would appreciate any advice or suggestions that you have. Thank you. This, this is really neat. Um, mm -hmm. I just, in terms of advice, we we did some work on old rehabilitated mine sites about uh, 20 years ago with a landform evolution model, and found that when a contour bank was breached, mm -hmm. the erosion that occurred after the breach of a contour bank was actually worse than if the contour banks weren't there in the first place. Yeah. And the reason being is that all the water is concentrated in mm -hmm. one little location. It's, it's the same with the terrace walls where they have the breach that concentrates the erosion in that area and you get gullying in those yeah, places. Yeah, and, that, and that, I, I think that's one of, the, one of the real advantages of looking at this with a landform evolution model rather than just a, a classical agricultural erosion model because the classic erosion models don't really capture that, mm -hmm. co capture the, the concentration of flow and the gully yeah. erosion that occurs. So I, I, I think it's really neat. I had a sort of a little bit of a practical question and uh, mm -hmm. like in our community we're just starting to reach out between sort of the agent based modelers and Michael Barton has been here a bunch of times mm -hmm. and like sort of been showing his um, repositories of agent based models and then more like this example of a landscape evolution model and you're mm -hmm. sort of at the forefront of combining these two. But uh, so I wanted to ask you about your practical experience of the Python code that you're working in the uh, landscape mm. evolution and then the net logo system that's kind of like prevalent in the agent-based yeah. community um, and just for us to learn. 
Yeah, so I'm just now learning agent-based modeling as well, and I'm starting out with NetLogo since that's very easy to learn. And what I'm not planning to use that when I go on. I'm planning to use the NetLogo itself to compare um, my my code with the, just the NetLogo to look make sure I'm doing the process modeling the processes correctly. I think NetLogo is a great way to learn the agent-based modeling. Um, but I think it's somewhat limited. It's very fast to do. I, I actually put the goat thing together in like an afternoon. Um, but it, it has, I've, I've seen people trying to couple it with other models and I think it's difficult to do. I think there are better things. I'm going to look into repast, I think, in Symfony. Um, or like bring both to like a Python framework? Yeah, I, because I understand Python a little bit better, so. Okay, yeah. thank you. Hi. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to, I guess, how and whether uh, you're going to put in the element, the agent-based element, where you actually incorporate the decision making by active humans doing the terracing, because that sounds like almost the most interesting part. And like yeah. how a it's, farmer decides, no, it's falling apart too much. This isn't <laughs> worth my time, or mm -hmm. that kind of decision. So I'm still working out exactly how I'm going to do it, but I think especially implementing the life cycle stages, I mean, that's why I want to use the agent base. Um, part of it is going to be looking at interactions between the landscape and the human. So looking at their studies of adoption of terraces in different places, and I'm going to use those as looking at especially farmers stop using terracing if they don't see that it helps them. So I can use that to help uh, look at the feed between landscape evolution and the human decisions. Does that answer? Kind of getting at it. That would be really cool. Yeah, hopefully. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.